Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pitts, the Ukraine War Frontline update for the 30th of March 2024. Thank you so much to JR, who has done the mapping again. What a ledge. And in fact, if you don't know what the lines mean on our map, uh, please check out the key on the screen at the moment, pause the video. Before we go to look at the uh, the front lines in particular places, we're going to look a little bit at the defences that Ukraine have been spending a lot of time and resources, money and effort building. There have been these criticisms of Ukraine that they haven't done it in certain places um, uh, soon enough, places like the west of Avdivka. Now, part of the reason is because they were on the attack and they were predicting uh, aid to be continued and to therefore um, not so much justify their their attacks, but but you know give them resources to do their attacks. And uh, when that stopped, all of a sudden they were like, "Oh right, now we're on a defensive. Oh right, we haven't got as far as we thought we were going to get, uh, and so we are going to be here now rather than fifty kilometers that way or something." Uh, so we need fortifications here. So the, the, the point was that when they were on the attack, uh, they were thinking they were going to get you know much further taking the southern front line here. They were thinking, as Zeluzhny said, 30 kilometers a day, we're going to be down to Tokmat, down to uh, down to Berdyansk or whatever. Um, and of course, that didn't happen. And so they didn't build fortifications there because they were expecting to be much further south. That would be just a complete waste of money and time and resources. But it soon became apparent that actually they weren't going to move that quickly. So then they started thinking about uh, building these fortifications. But there was this big argument between who should pay for it. Should it be the central government through the armed forces or should it be private enterprises? But then they need to be contracted by who they're going to be contracted by, the central government or different areas, so on and so forth. So this became a bit of um, a, a cock up, really, uh, as far as I can work out. You have places like Zaporizhia that built their own because it's got more money as an oblast and larger areas of it remaining not under uh, control of of the Russians and so they were able to build some of their fortifications out there kind of localized money but of course Donetsk is a different kettle of fish uh, and Luhansk yeah uh, much less of that and so you know who pays for what uh, and in the end I think the central government got together and uh, they were just uh, unfortunately they delayed and and didn't get it sorted but then uh, brought forward this centralized uh, fortification unit or whatever to talk about and plan and strategize and, and implement these fortifications. Uh, but in certain places, that was too little too late. So Avdivka, which is not one of these places where they're expecting to march forward 30 kilometers a day. So th that argument as for why they didn't have trenches around here is is not not a sound. So there was, there was a lot of um, consternation when they lost Abdivka, that there weren't these fortifications to fall back on. And I guess they just weren't expecting to lose Abdivka. But you could you say, well, where's the contingency planning? And there was none, maybe out of too much confidence. And of course, when the artillery ammunition ran out uh, and when the Russians were able to pile on and use that aviation in a way that they hadn't so much previously. Yes, they've been using guided glide bombs, but not to the degree they started using around Abdivka and other places. The Russians just push forward and and Abdivka fell much more quickly and and I think it caught the Ukrainians out anyway the present situation now is that they have you know listened and and reacted um to the needs of their their frontline soldiers and built huge amounts of fortifications this is Zaporizhia down in the south and you can see the amount of effort that has been put into these fortifications they are really significant here uh, a lot of you know, well thought out construction taking place. You've got tank ditches there. Uh, you've got, uh, they're basically copying the Russians. Uh, they've got these pyramids, these dragon's teeth, and then prefabricated concrete structures. Every so often that will add more, um, more solidity to the fortifications. So people took the mickey. I, I never did actually take, take the mickey out of the Russian fortifications and, and dragon's teeth. People saying they, were, they would be really easy to overcome. They are, uh, uh, an obstacle and they're a nuisance and if they're cheap and cheerful and easy to put down you might as well do that but you can see the effort that's going on here this is quite significant and then uh, you have these prefabricated cylinders made out of the sort of corrugated metal that you, we're seeing that have stuff inside them as well and as well as prefabricated um, cuboids that have command 
nodes in, inside and team making facilities and all sorts of stuff, right? Um, that they can drop in and then hook up uh, and as well as making tunnels to protect from drones, but obviously you don't want complete tunnels, otherwise there's no point having fortifications, you're just completely underground. You need to be able to pop out and shoot things. Uh, so there's a trade-off there. But anyway, lots of thought going into these and they are stretching around all over the shop. Here we have more than 42 kilometers of anti-tank ditches uh, already dug in the Nipro Petrosk region. Report Serhi Lisak the head of the regional military administration. So these are regional areas, again, responsible for their fortifications. We are also increasing the number of tetrahedrons, so he drags his teeth, special concrete pyramids, of which more than 11,000 have already been installed. He writes, in the, and you can see here all of the, uh, you know, what, what this all looks like. Tank ditches can be straight, I guess, because they're just to stop tankers, tanks uh, driving into them and they get stuck. The... Uh, trenches are zigzag so if you did have air superiority you couldn't just drive down uh, a uh, uh, or fly down a straight line and just drop bombs right down a straight line you also can charge down them easily you need you need zigzags to protect um, different stretches from firing down them or bombing down them um, that's how I understand it. Anyway, uh, good news there. And in the Kiev region, so there's still, you know, I know not many people think Kiev is under too much of a threat from soldiers these days, but they have spent a lot of time also, uh, obviously as a capital city and uh, quite an important oblast, uh, spent some time protecting Kiev as well. 10,000 concrete pyramids installed there to strengthen the border. That'll be going up further to the north. So that's that. I thought I'd just share that with you. Um, we have just a little insight here. This is a Polish soldier fighting for the Ukrainians in the International Legion. He's describing the Russian assault tactics. Of course, this is anecdotal. Take it with a pinch of salt. Quote, they begin sending in the sheep. Behind them stands a finely trained Wadakrit soldier who uses the opportunity to map out Ukrainian positions. Okay, let's actually listen to what he says here. Uh, we'll just... Um, go through this as quick as I can. The Russian military divides its soldiers into two categories, he said, more useful and less useful. When they begin the assault, the least useful are always sent in as a first wave. This is kind of like it was at Bakhmut, right? Uh, there's usually at least one experienced soldier sent in with them to command them. That good soldier will get halfway and then retreat. The others will perish. Then goes the second wave with three better soldiers among them. Those three will also probably retreat. Once the coordinates of all the defensive positions have been established... Uh, then comes the best, finely trained, brave Russian soldiers. Uh, who do I say brave? Why do I say brave? Because they are brave guys who fight to the end. Uh, you took over their radio and you overheard them, says the interviewer. Uh, yes, send in the sheep. Meaning uh, that that first hopelessly ill-equipped wave, they only carried four magazines. Four magazines is enough for three minutes of combat. Uh, it's what you'll use up retreating, not to press assault. Uh, and then they go, I've no idea why. Uh, why are Russians doing it? Because behind them stands as good uh, a good, well-equipped soldier, uh, he says, that uses the opportunity to map the Ukrainian positions. Um, uh, to shoot, you need to put your head above the trench. Uh, you go so on and so forth. You, but you get a point. This is very much like we heard in Bakhmut, where they send in the uh, the Storm Z assault groups who were poorly trained convicts who were basically meat wave assaults. But they weren't like being used just for shits and giggles, right? They they they. It was all about grinding down. But also they did get information, and even if one did get to a particular point and they overwhelmed it then they send the second wave and then the third wave but then eventually you'd have your good fighters as he, as he says there who will fight themselves to the death um and better much better equipped and you heard this about the the wagner fighters those those ones that were really well trained and decent it wasn't just uh storm z battalions all the time um and that and that's how they use them they use them to to do these to to map out these positions and then uh, uh, they are better able to overcome the positions that wouldn't have otherwise been mapped out if you sent in your best guys first then don't know where the uh, the ukrainians are and then your best guys get shot so you use your poorer guys with only four magazines uh send them in they'll get shot up one might survive and then they they communicate where all the positions are and then you know send in the second wave to do pretty much the same and then the third wave can, can be much more um effective uh, and that's that that's how they appear to be working at least according to this chat right um going on 
to Belgrade, Russian schools in Belgrade near the border, Ukrainian border, shift to remote learning amid shelling. Earlier, the authorities of Belgrade Oblast can, uh, announced plans to evacuate up to 9,000 children to other regions. This is, I'm mentioning this in a frontline update to, to suggest that, you know, Belgrade is getting quite a lot of attention from the Ukrainians. We have seen the pro Russian, the free Russia uh, units attack in several places along the Belgrade uh, border, the Belgrade Oblast border here. Um, and this is where, because as you can see, Belgorod is not far from the border, as is Kharkiv, not far from the border. They they use um, Belgorod Oblast as the launch pad, quite literally, to launch missiles and shells and rockets into Kharkiv Oblast and into Kharkiv. And so the Ukrainians will be continuing to focus an awful lot on taking out um, key installations around Belgorod. Uh, to, in order to to you know let Kharkiv off the hook, Kharkiv off the hook somewhat. Um, anyway, as you can see, no move again to the Kupians to uh, Svatova to Kremina front line. Incredibly um, stable, all things considered. Uh, I keep saying the same thing every day. There were rumours that this is going to be a huge attack around here. We've heard that for a year. The amassing of 100,000 people and so on and so forth. But actually, the reality is that, uh, yeah, it is. Um, it, it seems to be fairly stable, particularly up the northern area. Uh, indeed, even Andrew Perpetua on his live stream was saying this salient that's seen a lot of activity and the Russians have lost an awful lot of equipment there has actually been relatively quiet last couple of days. So uh, interesting to uh, think, well, I wonder what position the Russians are in, how much they've got left in the tank around there. Uh, quiet around Bilarivka and even down to Bakhmut, where you know, things are things have been very challenging uh, but what was also interesting from their live stream last night is this idea that even if Skr, i know that that here we have surat maps pro russian mapper saying that the russians control all, all of even that is according to pretty much everyone not the case but they do control or everyone else they do control much of this high ground above even and that makes this just a bit of a kill box here uh, and as as it's on the lower ground uh, the Russians can just fire down into here. So why has it, according to the to Andrew Perpetua and Deep State Maps, why is it that they have, the Russians that is, not advanced much in quite a long time? And there are some rumours, as according to his live stream, that the Ukrainians have blown up all the basements in Ivanivska, which means that if you've blown up all the basements, there's nowhere to hide here. So the Ukrainians aren't really, I don't think, fighting street to street here. In fact, they don't like fight. What he was suggesting is that this is a horrible place to be. You do not want to be defending Ivanivska because it's basically flat and rubble and there are no basements. But that also means that the Russians don't want to, the Ukrainians don't want to fight it because there's only one road in, really. And that is um, that is under fire control of the Russians, uh, as is much of the forest coming into Ivanivska. So you, you, you don't want to be sent there to defend it. But the Russians don't either, because actually uh, the Ukrainians are using lots of you know a fair amount of drones in the area and they are hammering the russians and the russians can't hide in the basements if that's true the, these are just rumors coming from various people so it might not be true at all but it would make sense of the fact that according to the other mappers there's been no russian advances there when they were starting to advance quite a bit so it just could be a, just a horrible place to be i think this area to the north is far more important than even isco itself you know, yes, this acts as a kind of um, slows the Russians down, uh, acts as a buffer zone to Chazyv Yar, but but it, it's a high ground that the Russians will want. So I think if the Russians advance here, that's much more important than the Russians the Russians advancing in Ivaniska itself. Anyway, again, no changes there, no changes in the southern area, Klesichivka, down to Kurdi Um Yeah, this is all good news for the Ukrainians when there is uh, very little advance and actually this main front around Abdivka no change there uh, there is a little bit to the south around Pervomysky but just to say that the Russians really are seeming to be trying very hard to take Semenivka and this area between Badici and Olivka that the Ukraine is still hanging on to uh, it appears even to the eastern side of the river um, I don't know that the Russians do have this purchase the other side of the river as according to Surat maps but they're very unlikely to undo that and likewise up in in Badici but there is quite a lot of um uh quite a lot of 
activity taking place around there. It's interesting. I've I literally just seen, I paused them because I had a message from uh, Pierre Dupont. So many of you will know I went out to uh, out to Ukraine for a couple of weeks and Pierre was with me in a car and he, he's actually got quite a few interesting observations, which is one, there's an awful lot of kit, Ukrainian kit being driven around. He said more than I've seen before. So I don't know quite what that says, but I, I find it quite interesting uh, that, that that is the case. But he's also just, just on the point of um, those fortifications. He said so many dragon's teeth are being delivered. I just passed six truckloads. It's on an industrial scale at last. So it's really interesting that while I'm talking to you about that, someone on the ground is uh, is is saying that to me and uh, he's saying again that, that there are uh, big changes in the region that he's in which is a sort of Izium, Izium region down to Kramatorsk uh, that there are big trucks that are plowing um, along there are extensive fort fortifications being built um, and in the Sversk Liman area likewise so that's to say sorry just just because he's literally messaging me now and trying to read that and speak to you at the same time. That's to say that in this general area here, there's a lot of fortifications being built, which is really good news. This is a key area. The Russians, the Ukrainians will not want the Russians to take this. The Russians will desperately want to take this because it gives them the chance of getting this ring here. Andrew Perpetua was talking about there being basically four areas where the Russians seem to be wanting to attack. The Terni uh, salient there, the Bakhmut area, the Avdivka area itself, and then south of Avdivka, sort of your Marienka, uh, Krasnohurka, and, and whatnot. Um, so, the, you know, if you are a Russian commander, or, or you know, the uh, I guess Grasimov, where would you attack? And, and what would you do, or would you just keep trying to attack in all the places all at once? Uh, they, there are some theories that that building all these de defenses could be, you know, because the, the Ukrainians are going to have to retreat at some point. And we've heard this from Zelensky. If we don't get that $60 billion aid package, there's every chance that we're going to have to retreat, that, that our future in this war is inextricably linked to US support and if there's that impasse in Congress we're in trouble and so these defensive lines could be being built you know too sweet in this particular area in Seversk and behind Bakhmut because um, because they are looking to retreat eventually from Chazy Vyar and places around here maybe this Seversk front line so I don't know there, there are several ways of seeing that but uh, anyway uh, in the Avdivka area sorry uh, as I digress um we have some, uh, well, no gains today, but some gains over the last week as the Russians are still trying to push, trying to push down to the south here in Tonyenka. But there, are, there will be, they will be coming across larger fortifications as they move to the west here, as the Ukrainians have finally sort of got things going. Uh, the further you move back, the question, the, what, what people I think were. Um, angry with was that there were no fortifications down this kind of step over uh, to Olivka to Tonyenka line uh, that the Ukrainians could have fallen back on straight from Avdivka and actually they were doing a fighting retreat and, and they had to rely on this uh, river and higher ground here to help them. Um, anyway, as you come further to the south, gains is according to all three mappers here around Pervomysky where they've now filled in this gap of grey zone uh, where they, uh, there was still some uh, grey zone there and indeed have come round the edge of this pond or reservoir or whatever and have taken control further to the south there. So they really are, uh, you know, taking control of most of Pervomysky now. Uh, Pisky seems a long, long way away, doesn't it? So you've got Pisky here, it turns into Pervomysky at this junction and then you've got this very long, very long settlement here, Pervomysky. Very, not... Not very wide. It's just one road settlement going all the way back here. If you remember, like a year ago, it was. And we, there's some incredible footage of a tank battle going on here. Um, it seems so long ago now. Uh, and the Russians have pushed the Ukrainians right back along uh, Pervomysky. As uh, Surat Matt says here, the Russian army made significant advances in Pervomysky and control 80% of it. During the last few days, the Ukrainian army retreated to um, uh, a large part of their troops from the locality to the neighbouring Natalova. Uh, the advances made by Russian troops north of Pervomysky after the capture of Tonyanka accelerated the advances 
uh, of the troops in the first locality. So this was enabled by the successes the Ukrainians had further to north in Tonyanki that allowed them to have these successes here as recorded to Surat maps. I can't talk to the uh, truth of that, but they are, do seem to be making those gains. All the mappers agree there. Then when we come further down past Novelsky towards uh, Stara uh, Mikhailivka Mik towards Krasnoharivka, there are some gains just north of Stara Mikhailivka here. Indeed, I think there are reports, reports on this. Uh, Geolocated footage confirms Russian advances north of Stara Mikhailivka after initially securing the southern part of Krasnoharivka near Marinka. Russia is now conducting operations to secure the northern part and surround the town. So the idea is that this will help them by, as the Russians, or as any side would like to, you know, if you're going to take a town, you want to surround it, operationally surround it, and then everyone gets out of dodge because you don't want to be sieged, you don't want to be bombed. You don't, you don't want to be flattened with aviation bombs. Uh, so the Russians will seek to, to come here from the north uh, as well as from the south and through Marienka onto Herorivka, where indeed um, Surat Maps has some gains uh, for the Russians as well. Uh, indeed, I think that's here. Yep. Uh, situation southwest of Donetsk. The Russian army entered uh, the first parts of Mashinostroitel, Dachas, north of Novomikhailivka, and part of the forest belt northwest of the warehouses. That's uh, Novomikhailivka, actually, uh, which is further to the south. Sorry, that's over here. That wasn't there. So, anyway, slight advances in Marinka, but no tweet to go along with that. Uh, north of Krasnohirivka, and then Novomikhailivka, which is, uh, you know, it is a bit of an issue around here. The, the Ukrainians are. Uh, under a lot of pressure, the Russians are making consistent advances here. Um, and yeah, Surat Maps uh, talking to that. So uh, again, I'll ask the same question. You know, if you were a Russian commander and you, what would you think was the most valuable? Uh, attacking in this kind of Marienka, Novomikhailivka area, uh, further to north around Avdivka, it, would it be Chazivyar for you or would it be Terni Torska? Uh, and it depends whether you're, this is a question. Andrew Perpetual asked last night in his live stream. And it depends whether you're more offensively minded or defensively minded or cautious. And I don't know whether it's because I'm quite cautious, but if I was a Russian commander, I would I I think it would be quite sensible to actually and none of them talked about this particularly. They're all talking more about how they would they would do some of these, which again, I would either go down here in Novomerkalivka. I think this is super important and it will help all along this front line. Um, but also the turning in Torsky, if you can get the Jerobets River. Uh, so the Russians really want to get to this river that goes up there. You would take basically the rest of Luhansk bar a, t a tiny bit. So, you know, I, well, it would help you take the rest of Luhansk. There's, there's lots of work to do up there. But the Jerobets River, taking that would help you help you do that. Um, and I just think that uh, the, the, the Ukrainians here will be pushed back against this uh, water barrier and I just I think you should be able to do that relatively easily but evidently not because they have lost a lot of equipment there and they've lost a lot of equipment in uh, in Avdivka and they've lost a lot of equipment in Novomikhailivka and indeed around Krasnoharivka so pretty much everywhere the Russians have attempted to attack it has been disastrous by any metrics that we would use in the West but by the Russian metrics, it's like, yeah, we've only lost this many people per square kilometer. So we've got the square kilometer. Jobs are good. And um, they just yeah, see, I think, human value slightly differently to maybe uh, how I would. Uh, no changes to the southern front line, according to my mapping sources. And also Krinky as well appears to be um, pretty much the same as it was. So, yeah, uh, that's the front line update for you. Hopefully that was of some use. Thank you so much for your support. Please like, subscribe and share. Take care and I'll speak to you tomorrow.